What's up, y'all? It's the kid Fort Worth Fabian, Big Boss Fable. I'm back with the video for you guys, man. I'm actually doing a Mr. Ballin reaction uh, to Texas Cat Lady's House of Horrors. This dropped March 2nd, 2022, over 3 million views, 174,000 likes. Let me know y'all's thoughts on this one in the comment section below. I actually did do a recent reaction to, um, the you know, this girl's about to live a nightmare, his more recent uh, drop on the channel. So go check out my reaction to that and be sure to also check out my Mr. Ballin playlist. So with that being said, man, let's hop right into the video. Let's not waste any more time, man. We got Mr. Ballin, the Texas Cat Ladies, House of Whores. Check out my playlist page as well, man. If you're new to the channel, subscribe just to give you additional reasons to subscribe to the channel, man. Let's go. Today, we're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once or twice a week. So if that's of interest to you, please log on to the Like Button's Netflix account and fast forward all of their continue watching shows approximately two or three minutes. Also, please subscribe to get into today's stories. Located on the far northern tip of Maine, right on the border of Canada, lies a small rural town called Van Buren. Van Buren is home to about 2,000 people who, for the most part, have lived in Maine for their entire lives, and they tend to be very rugged and very competent people. But unless you live in Van Buren or know someone in Van Buren or have family out there, there's no reason you would have heard of this particular town. Nothing really happens in this town, at least nothing that makes headlines. However, that would change. In 2019, Van Buren made international headlines because of one man, Ronald Sear. As a young man in the 1950s, Ooh. Ronald Sear joined the Air Force and fought in the Korean War. And then after he got out of the military, he moved back to his hometown of Van Buren, Maine. And he moved into a very modest two-story home right near town. And for a little while, he just kind of floated about, didn't really have a direction in life. But eventually, because of his love for working with his hands and his general skill at working with his hands and building things, he started a small but successful tool selling company that he ran right out of his shed on his property fast forward to 2000 that boy was selling dope at his property let's keep it 1k you know he was moving that way 2019 ronald sear at that time was 65 years old and he still lived in the same property right near town in van buren however he now lived alone and he still ran this tool selling business right out of his work shed and for ronald this was enough he was very content with his life. He was very happy. But that year, he would face a crisis. One bright, sunny morning in the summer of that year, Ronald left his house and he walked over to his shed. He went inside and right away he noticed something. Ronald kept all these bins inside of his shed that were full of all of the different tools that he would sell. And because he was in there all the time, either literally selling tools or tinkering with whatever it was he was building himself, was tinkering. he was very aware of how full each of these bins were and anytime they got low he would order more so he had enough supply to sell and so he went into a shed this morning and he noticed right away that a couple of the bins appeared to be a little bit lower than he remembered and right away Ronald is thinking you know did I forget to order supplies to fill these bins up did I just forget to do that but he's thinking to himself you know I am meticulous in making sure my inventory is full at all times I've been doing this for decades and so it can't be me you know maybe I I took the tools and I brought them into my house and, and I've left them in there or maybe they're in my truck. And so Ronald, believing there's a totally logical explanation for this, would leave his shed and he would search his property, but he can't find these tools anywhere. And so he began calling his family and his friends to see if, you know, maybe they had come by and borrowed some of these tools or maybe they knew what had happened to them. But everyone he spoke to said, no, I, I have no idea. And so by that afternoon, Ronald had found himself back inside of his work shed looking around, thinking to himself, have I been robbed? It was the only logical thing he could think of uh -huh. that would explain this loss. So. And so Ronald drove to the police station and he spoke to police and he explained what happened. But unfortunately, the police's reaction to what he was telling them was not exactly what he wanted. They basically assumed that, you know, he just had miscounted. That in reality, <laughs> the tools were either still in the shed. and then he, just he said, silly old man, you just miscounted. You're getting old. 
<laughs> it's kind of disrespectful though. Can't take his word for it, come on. Just forgot how many were supposed to be in there or he had just kind of lost them on his property somewhere that they were, they were bound to turn up. And so the police told him, look, Ronald, go back and search your property. I'm sure they're Boy, there. If go and home. if you get some proof that someone actually stole from you, then come back to us. And so Ronald was really annoyed by this. He wanted them to take this seriously, but he could tell they just were not going to. And so Ronald drove back to his house. He went inside, he hopped on his computer and he began researching what other homeowners did to protect themselves from things like theft. And one of the things he came across was setting up trip wires all around the perimeter of your property. Mm. Basically, you take these thin wires and you stretch them out very tight, very low to the ground, and you anchor them on each side. And then on the wire, itself you hang little bells and so in theory if an intruder were to walk onto your property they would most likely not see the trip wires on the ground and they would kick them and that would cause the bells to ring thereby alerting the homeowner of their presence Ronald mm. loved this idea so he went out and he set up trip wires all around his property but over the next several days after these wires were stood up None of the wires made any sound, and still more tools continued to go missing. This was also in spite of the fact that his shed was locked at night. And so Ronald's thinking to himself, whoever's doing this is clearly watching me and kind of monitoring what I'm doing. They must be aware of the trip wires, and they must be sneaking into the shed. That's how you become delusional. First off, I was going to say, I wouldn't even use trip wires. I, don't, I wouldn't want to know somebody's on my property. Like, if you're stealing from me, I want to be able to fit, like find you out if you're going to break into the house hear it then you know i get strapped ready for you to come in blow you away something like that but i don't want to hear you running around outside and hear bells going off on my property like mid sleep every night but you know unfortunately that's not the case in this scenario because they never went off you know, at some time that I, I have the doors unlocked. I mean, this is this is a professional thief. And so as Ronald is thinking about this master thief that is targeting him, he has the sudden fear that if he can't stop this person from breaking into his shed and taking his tools, how can he possibly protect himself against this person breaking into his home and stealing things from in there, which included all of his cash and many other values. He lost it. And so Ronald became very fearful and decided the only thing he, he could paranoid. do was really be up his home security system and so he hopped back online and he began googling other ways to protect your property and after discovering a number of really effective techniques he got to work he began building all these home defense systems and placing them all around his property and after all of these kind of diy security measures were put up the theft of his tools stopped and in Ronald's mind, that validated that his defense system had worked. He was effectively preventing theft, but this would not be the end of his troubles. Fast forward to Thanksgiving that year, so November 28th, and the Van Buren police got a very frantic phone call from Ronald. He was totally hysterical. He wasn't really making sense. And the police, they tried to understand what was going on, but all they could get from Ronald was that he was requesting police to come to his residence immediately. And so the police, they hang up and they're thinking, okay, you know, we know Ronald was dealing with a potential thief. Maybe he literally caught the thief red handed and he wants us to come and arrest this person. And who knows, maybe they're fighting at his residence right now. And so the police speed over to Ronald's house. They pull into his driveway. And at first glance, nothing looks out of the ordinary. Ronald's truck is in the driveway and there's no obvious signs of a disturbance, but they notice the front door to Ronald's house is wide open. And so the police park their cars in Ronald's driveway. They get out and they run up onto the front porch and they're standing in front of this open door and they look down and they can see there's a very obvious blood trail starting from the front of Ronald's house going straight back down a hallway that looped around to the left and out of sight. And so right away, the police are yelling into the house, Ronald, Ronald, are you okay? What's going on? And somewhere deep inside of the house, they hear what sounds like Ronald make a kind of guttural sound. And so immediately this tips the police that more than likely Ronald has been hurt and he likely is the one who made this blood trail. And so the police draw their guns and they go inside of Ronald's house, not really sure what they're going to find. They don't know 
know if there's some intruder or attacker or someone in here that's harmed Ronald, but they make their way down this hall following the blood trail. They turn the corner and then sitting at the end of the blood trail is Ronald. He's sitting down with his back to some cabinets in the kitchen and he's clutching his midsection. He is covered in blood. He's completely pale. And so right away, the officers call in backup, but then as a security measure, they search the rest of the first floor to make sure there is no other person here. There was no one on the first floor. They went he to the second floor. Up. They peeked around up there. They didn't see anyone. So they rushed back down to Ronald, who's still just sitting there, and they begin administering first aid, and they're trying to get him to explain what happened. How did you get hurt? But Ronald is clearly in shock. He's kind of in a daze. He's not making sense. And then by the time the paramedics showed up, just a couple of minutes later, Ronald had slipped into unconsciousness. When Ronald was wheeled out of the house, the responding officers and the backup officers, who by now had arrived, decided to search the rest of Ronald's house to see if there was some clue as to what had happened. And so they began searching in the kitchen, looking around, but there wasn't anything that stood out to them. And then they began walking around towards the living room. And when they got into the living room, one of the officers suddenly screamed to everyone inside to stop where they were, stop moving. It would turn out Ronald, as part of his very beefed up home security system, had installed various booby traps all around his property, including inside of his house. And some of these traps were gun booby traps. The officer that had yelled for everyone to stop had spotted one of these traps. He saw a handgun anchored to the ceiling aimed at the front door, and there was a string attached to the trigger that was also then attached to the doorknob of the front door. And so if this trap were live and some person opened the front door, it would activate this trap, causing the gun to shoot them. And so clearly, Ronald had accidentally left this particular booby trap on, and he had accidentally activated it, shooting himself. And so after the officer sees this gun anchored to the ceiling, he tells everyone, and they begin looking up and just looking around to see if there are other traps. And amazingly, there are. In other doorways, just from where they're standing, they can see the barrels of guns pointing down that are obvious. I said not a real photo. Credit of saw. How about to say? If that's what his house looked like, homie tripping. But no, nah, I figured he had, you know, created it was self harm. He had done it to himself. He just got so delusional, so lost in his own, you know, fear and anxiety that, you know, he ends up just setting all these traps up. Booby traps. In their haste to get in there and figure out what was going on, they hadn't noticed all of these guns in the ceiling. And so it was just kind of a miracle that none of the other traps had been set off. Ronald would be rushed to the hospital that night, but he would pass away from his wound. His death would be ruled an accident, and to this day, we don't know if he really was dealing with a professional thief that was stealing his tools, or if it was just nah. a figment of his imagination. I don't know about that one. The wait is finally over. Shen Yun Mary Cerruti had a difficult childhood. Growing up in the 1950s and early 1960s in Houston, Texas, Mary's family barely had enough money to get by. And then by the time Mary was 21, both of her parents had passed away, leaving her with nothing. After their deaths, Mary kind of bounced around Houston, going from one low paying job to the next. And then eventually she met a man that she fell madly in love with and they got married. But unfortunately that marriage would end in divorce. After Mary got over that heartbreak, she would meet another man who she would also fall in love with and they would get married too. But like her first marriage, this one also ended in divorce. At this point, Mary was so devastated by yet another heartbreak that she just kind of accepted that she was not gonna get married again. She was not gonna have a family of her own. But she didn't let this get her down. Instead, she kind of embraced her life as a loner. Fast forward to 2015, and she Mary weirdo. was 61 years old, and she was still living alone. She lived in a small home in a Houston neighborhood. This neighborhood, over the last several decades, had really begun to grow. Lots of new apartment complexes were being built all the time, and in fact, one of the apartment developers had approached Mary and offered to buy her house so they could build over her land, but she had refused because she loved her house. She did not want to sell it. It didn't matter what they offered her. 
And so she was the only house in this long stretch of apartment mm. buildings that didn't sell. But Mary kind of liked it. She wrote in her diary that her bungalow was like a castle and all these apartment buildings all around her were her castle walls. Mary didn't really have much contact with other people. She didn't have a consistent job, so she didn't have relationships with co-workers. She didn't have much contact, if any, with her living family. And she really didn't have any friends, with the exception so of one woman who was in town who owned an arts and craft shop, who Mary would periodically go into town and say hello to. But despite all that, Mary was not lonely. She had lots and lots of cats and she loved cats. Anytime she saw a stray cat out in the neighborhood, Mary would get the cat food and water and then eventually would try to coax the cat to come into her house. And then when it did, she would win the cat's trust and then she would give it a place to live and she would feed it and take care of it. And so before long, she had dozens of cats living in the house with her. And so these cats kind of became Mary's best friends. And so she rarely left the house, if ever. She mostly just stayed in the house with them. In February of that year, one of Mary's neighbors happened to be walking by her property and they looked over and they saw a stack of mail had grown on her front porch, indicating that Mary had not opened her door to get her mail. And this neighbor mm. also noticed that while Mary's property did tend to get a little bit overgrown with the trees and the grass, it was exceptionally overgrown, like no one was even trying to take care of it. And so this neighbor was concerned that maybe something had happened to Mary. And so they opened up her fence, they walked across across the yard, they went up onto the porch and they knocked on the front door, but it was silent. And so this neighbor kind of leaned over and looked in the window that was just to the left of the door to see if maybe they could look inside, but there was a curtain drawn across that window, so they couldn't see anything. And so the neighbor tried knocking on the door one more time, but again, met with silence. And so after standing there for a minute, the neighbor left the front porch and walked around to the side of the house to see if maybe they could look in one of those windows. But when they went around to the side, those windows were covered with curtains too. So so the neighbor walked back to the front of the property and just stood there looking at the house wondering what they should do and something told them that something's off something's wrong someone needs to make sure mary really is okay someone needs to get inside of this house and so the neighbor called the houston police and explained the situation a few minutes later the houston police arrived and they too went right up onto mary's porch they knocked on her door it was met with silence and so after that the police talked to one of the other neighbors and got a key that mary had apparently given them previously and the police went back to Mary's front door, they used the key, they unlocked the door, they opened it up, and right away they were hit with this horrible smell coming from inside the house. The police pushed the door the rest of the way open and they stepped inside Three. and they yelled out for Mary, but it was silent. And then before the police even began walking around looking for her, they looked off to their left and the right inside of the house and they saw there were all these dead cats all over the ground. And so the Houston police didn't know what happened to Mary, but right away they're thinking, okay, you know, we've seen scenarios like this before where someone who lives alone that no one really checks on dies unexpectedly. And then when they pass away, all of their pets are trapped in the house. They're not getting fed. And so they pass away too. And so the police at this point are fully expecting to find Mary's dead body somewhere in the house. And so they begin walking through the house looking for it. But after searching the house top to bottom, they could not find Mary. And so the police leave Mary's house. And at this point, there are people outside gathered because they see the police cars. And so the police grabbed a couple of the neighbors and they asked them, you know, do you know anything about this woman? You know, did she say anything about where she was going? Did she you see did. her leave at any point? And the consensus amongst the neighbors they spoke to was that Mary basically kept to herself. She did not travel. She didn't go anywhere. She mostly just stayed in her house with her cats. And so it was very unlikely that she would have just abandoned the property and abandoned her cats because she loved them so much. And so the police at this point are thinking, okay, she's got to be in this house somewhere. And so the police called a few more officers to the property and the group went back inside of Mary's house and they really looked for Mary thinking that, you know, maybe she slipped into a closet and that's where she passed away. Or, you know, maybe she's just hidden somewhere in the house. And so they really kind of ripped the house apart that's looking weird. for her. But again, there was just nothing. And so after they finally stopped the search without finding Mary, the police contacted Mary's extended family and they asked them the same questions. You know, did Mary say anything about a trip she was going to take? You know, is there any reason she would just abandon her property? And they all would say, look, we don't talk to Mary. We don't know where she went. We have no idea. And so for a little while, the Houston police continued to search for Mary in and around Houston. 
But eventually, after finding nothing, the search kind of stopped and they reached out to Mary's family and said, you know, if you hear anything else about what happened to Mary, please let us know. Several months later, Mary's house went into foreclosure because no one was making the payments anymore and the bank put her house up for auction. And a real estate entrepreneur in Houston bought the house up quickly and after cleaning it out, he put it on the market to be rented out. And for the next couple of years, several tenants lived in Mary's old house, none of them staying for very long. Then in March, March of 2017, when the property was vacant, this young couple reached out to the landlord and said they were looking to rent and they were hoping to potentially stay in this property for two or three years. The landlord was thrilled and he sent over a lease for them to sign. And then once the couple had signed the lease and the property was theirs, the uh -oh. husband decided to just go over on his own and walk around the property and see what they would need to buy in terms of furnishings. And so the husband arrives at the property, he goes in the front door, he walks around the first floor, and then at some point he decides he wants to go up into the attic to see how much storage space they have. And so he gets underneath the trap door in the ceiling, he grabs the string and he pulls it down, revealing this folded up ladder. He flips down the lower ladder piece and puts it on the ground, and then he began climbing up. Once he got up into the attic, he stayed standing on the ladder and just kind of scanned around, and he saw there really wasn't much up there. There was a couple of metal cages that appeared to have been for pets or something, but it was very dirty and dark, and it appeared like no one had really come up here in a long time. And he kind of assumed that, you know, the other tenants weren't using this as a storage space. And so the husband was about to go back down the ladder when he noticed off to the right side of the attic, kind of far away from the ladder, Hell right nah. where the roof begins to pitch down, he saw one of the floorboards was kind of popped up like it shouldn't be. And he stared at it and he's looking around at the rest of the attic and all of the floorboards were perfectly uniform, but that one was really jacked up. And so he was curious and so he climbed up into the attic and he kind of stooped down and he walked over to this loose floorboard and when he was standing over it, he could tell that this floorboard had kind of popped off of this hole in the ground, that the floorboard had been covering this hole, but the hole was dark. And so he pulled out his phone and he turned on his flashlight and he looked straight down and he aimed the light into this hole. Now, this hole was basically just a gap between two of the walls on the first floor. And so he's shining his light down into this gap and he sees at the bottom the remains of the woman the Houston police have been looking for for the past two years. Mary Cerruti. While no one knows for sure exactly what happened to her, it's believed back in early 2015 when she went missing, she had gone up into the attic where perhaps her cats liked to sunbathe off to the side of the attic because there was a big window that looked into the attic. And so she went up there to maybe feed the cats or check on the cats that were up there. And when she walked over to that side of the attic where the window looked in, she stepped on that loose floorboard and it gave out from her weight and she kind of fell through it like a trap door and fell down into that gap between the walls. It's unlikely she was hurt from this fall, but when she stood back up again in this kind of narrow space, she would have realized very quickly that there was nowhere for her to go. You can't go left, you can't go right, and you can't get back up into the attic. It was too far up for her to reach, and there was no way for her to kind of use the walls to climb back up because the space she was in was so narrow. I mean, she could barely move. She also didn't have a cell phone on her, so she couldn't call anyone. One. If she screamed out, no one would have heard her because she was behind several walls of insulation. And because no one ever checked on her, there was no one that was just going to find her trapped in the wall. She that was sucks. totally on her own. And so this is what happens when you got no network and you just alone by yourself, the cat lady. Damn, if something happens to you, nobody knows. At least keep in contact with your family. Trapped in this little space, Mary spent probably a couple of days screaming and trying to get her way out, but nothing worked, and then eventually she passed away. RIP to Mary. Unfortunately, all of her cats did too. Her death was ruled an accident. In the spring of 2017, Antonio Navarrete was on top of the world. Just a year earlier, the 21-year-old Florida resident had met the love of his life, a young woman named Daisy Martinez. And now, Daisy was pregnant, and so she and Antonio were very excited about starting a family together. For the time being, Antonio and Daisy were living with Antonio's parents in his hometown of Waimama, which is a quiet Waimama. rural suburb just south of Tampa. 
but Antonio had a bright future ahead of him. Ever since he had graduated high school, he knew what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to be an auto mechanic, and he had the skills to do it. From the time he was a toddler, he had always been obsessed with cars, breaking apart his toy cars and putting them back together. And then as he got a little bit older, he began drawing these very intricate drawings of cars that he loved or designs for new cars. And then when he was a teenager, he began actually tinkering around with real cars until he finally acquired a car of his own. It was a white Chevy lowrider pickup truck that he tricked out with all these fancy lights and special rims and this huge sound system that took up most of his back seat. It was thanks in part to this truck, which he nicknamed Casper, that Antonio, who was too shy to be much of a ladies' man, met up with Daisy in the first place. Antonio had driven Casper to a local car meetup for other car enthusiasts, where you could basically park your vehicle and you could walk around and see what other people did to upgrade or enhance their vehicles. And so while Antonio was there, he was walking around when he saw on the far side of this meetup, there was this unbelievably beautiful young woman and he found himself just staring at her. He couldn't help it. And this young woman, who was Daisy, she eventually would look up and she would smile at him and the rest, as they say, was history. The rest was Six history. months later, uh, not long after Daisy had moved in with Antonio at his parents' house and the couple had announced to their delighted family that they were going to have a baby, Antonio got yet another good piece of news. He'd landed a good job with a company that did maintenance work for Tampa Electric Company's Big Bend Power Plant, which was located in Apollo, Florida, which was about 10 miles to the east of Antonio's parents' home. Now, this was not Antonio's dream job. He still very much wanted to eventually become an auto mechanic, but this job paid 12 bucks an hour, nearly double what he was used to making. And so with this job, he and Daisy would finally be able to raise enough money to get a place of their own, hopefully before the baby arrived that fall. Also, Antonio had been told by other people who worked at this company that this was actually a really easy job, that pretty much you just rolled around on golf carts all day picking up trash. It was perfect. A few weeks later, on June 24th, Antonio found himself driving in his truck to the Big Bend power plant for his first day on the job. As he drove, Happy he would have glanced over at the picture of Daisy he had taped to his dashboard. Board. She was the only woman he had ever loved besides his mother. When Antonio arrived at the Big Bend power plant, he was totally amazed at just how enormous this thing was. It was basically this huge factory that sat right up against the water, and there were four huge smokestacks coming out of the ceiling of this factory with white smoke billowing out of them. This plant produced electricity, and they did this by burning coal. This process was done in four distinct units that were inside of this factory that Antonio was looking at. And each of these units is comprised of a humongous boiler, which is basically a 12-story tall oven. And so coal is loaded into this huge boiler, and it burns at the bottom of the boiler, creating some steam. And that steam goes Damn. up the boiler and begins to turn these hot huge... Hot on, hot on, Let's put this in perspective. He a little itty bitty guy. A human being shouldn't even be standing next to one of these right here. What is you doing, my boy? Creating some steam, and that steam goes up the boiler and begins to turn these huge turbines, creating the electricity, and then the steam just continues up the boiler and then out its respective smokestack into the air. In newer units, the airborne ash, which is a natural byproduct of burning coal, is captured inside of the boiler. But at Big Bend, three of their four units were built in the 1970s, so they were older models, yeah, and they garbage. did not capture the airborne Ash uh -huh. inside the boilers. Choke. Instead, the ash would get heated up so much that it would melt and turn into a substance called slag, which basically is molten lava, like the stuff that comes out of volcanoes. That's what slag is. And so as this slag kind of builds up inside of the boiler, it would go through this man-sized hole at the very bottom of the boiler, and right below that hole is this 30-foot tall water tank called a cooling tank, and this red-hot slag 
it basically dumps down into that water, which cools it off, turning it into these kind of glassy rocks. And then they settle at the bottom of this 30 foot cooling tank. And at the bottom of Too the cooling tank on. is this grinding mechanism that pulls going these on. hardened, cooled off little boulders of slag into it and it crushes them up and spits them out on the other side as little tiny bits of slag chips. And then these chips get sold for use in everything from sandpaper to roofing shingles. So after Antonio had spent several minutes just admiring this gargantuan this building he would be working in, he gathered up his things, he hopped out of his truck, and he headed toward the front doors. That day and the next couple of days were very uneventful for Antonio. He basically just sat in a break room and watched videos about safety and training and then when he wasn't doing that, he was out trying to navigate around the inside of this huge factory, which was basically this huge maze. And he found very quickly that it was a very hazardous place to work as there were huge trucks moving around inside of it. It was super loud and there was just heavy machinery operating constantly all around you. But after several days of just kind of walking around and asking people what things were, Antonio felt like he had a pretty good handle on the layout and also on what his job would entail. On Thursday, June 29th, so just four four days into doing this new job, Antonio woke up in his parents' house in a really good mood because the next day, that Friday, Daisy was going in for an ultrasound and they were going to find out whether their baby was a boy or a girl. And he was very excited about this. And so Antonio came downstairs, he grabbed a quick bite to eat, and then he kissed Daisy on the cheek and he headed outside into his truck and began the commute to work. A few hours later, Antonio's mother was in the grocery store when she pulled her phone out of her purse and she noticed Antonio had had called her and she missed it, but he had left a voicemail. And so she played the voicemail and then put the phone to her ear. And what she heard was quite possibly the most traumatic thing a mother could ever hear from their child. After leaving the house that morning, Antonio drove all the way to work, no problem. He parked in the lot, he went inside the building, and initially the day was like any other day. He just kind of drove around the facility and picked up trash and that was it. But just a couple of hours into his shift, two fairly significant issues arose simultaneously inside of Unit 2. In the boiler, the slag that was building up had somehow created a sort of plug over that man-sized hole where the slag was supposed to dump into the water chamber. And so as more and more slag was being created as the ash melted, it wasn't draining into that chamber. And so all of this slag was just building up on top of itself inside of the boiler. And then in the water chamber, completely unconnected from the issue in the boiler, the slag that had fallen into the water chamber that had cooled and settled at the bottom, it had landed in such a way that it actually blocked the grinding mechanism. And so Dang. none of the cooled slag boulders and... The, two of the worst things that go wrong on the same day, you know? Like, <laughs> hey, respect, salute to a lot of these, you know, warehouse factory workers. I've done warehouse jobs to a certain extent, but not like a lot of machinery like this. So, you know, shout out to those guys who get up every day, early hours, both of them too, to late hours. Um, and actually have to, you know, operate around this type of machinery. A lot of it is dangerous, it's dangerous, it's hazardous, but, you know, they do this day in and day out. And random days where just things go wrong can happen. So, it looks like this is one of those stories rocks were being ground up and expelled out the other side. And so they needed to fix these two issues quickly, otherwise Unit 2 would become basically ineffective. Now, the safe way to fix these two blockages would be to start by turning off Unit 2's boiler. And then once it was off, you could drop dynamite into the boiler itself and break up the blockage over the man-sized hole. And you could send a team into the water chamber after you drained it to chip away and move the blockage over the grinding mechanism. However, Turning a boiler off at a power plant is extremely expensive. And so the Tampa Electric Company decided, you know what, let's just have them fix these blockages without turning the boiler mm. off. And so at four in the afternoon, the a senior plant manager rounded up five other employees, which included Antonio, to come with him and do these repairs inside of Unit 2. And so the plan was to empty all the water from the cooling chamber of Unit 2, and then once it was empty, they would open something called the doghouse door, which is on the outside of the cooling chamber towards the bottom. They would open that up, giving them a line of sight into the bottom of this cooling chamber, where 
where that grinding mechanism was, where all those slag rocks had kind of come to a stop on top of it, and they would fire water cannons into the bottom of this cooling chamber to attempt to dislodge these slag rocks off of the grinding mechanism. And then after they cleared that blockage, they would shut the doghouse door and they would somehow deal with the blockage inside of the boiler. But that felt like a secondary issue. They needed to make sure the grinding mechanism was cleared before they did anything else. Now, you need to understand that this company had asked their employees to do this type of repair before, to do it with the boiler still on. And in the past, nothing bad had ever happened. And so these six guys, including Antonio, must have thought this was just totally routine, that we would never be asked to do something like this if it was extremely hazardous. But it would turn out what they were doing, making these repairs with the boiler still on, was quite possibly the most hazardous thing they could possibly do at this plant. But either way, the six-man team made their way over to Unit 2, and they began taking up positions with their water cannons right in front of the doghouse door. Antonio's job for this operation was actually not to be involved in getting the slag free. He was just going to be there to clean up during and after the operation. And so he stood kind of in front of the doghouse door, but maybe 10 or 15 feet back, just kind of standing back, watching the other guys do their jobs. Now, you need to understand the scale of the machinery in in front of Antonio and these other men. You have the water chamber, which is 30 feet tall, and then above the water chamber is the 12-story tall boiler that is still on. So there's coal actively burning inside of it. There's red hot slag, so like lava, just kind of tumbling around inside of it. And the Should steam be nowhere near inside that, of this boy. boiler is well over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. And so they are dwarfed by this totally dangerous piece of machinery. But eventually, their operation begins. The senior plant manager has the water chamber drained, and then after it's empty, they open the doghouse door, and Antonio watched as the other five men took turns with their water cannons, firing them through the store at the big slag rocks that are sitting on top of the grinding mechanism. And it wasn't really working that well, but they were starting to make some progress. And Antonio likely was just kind of getting bored, waiting for this to be over, because there really wasn't much for him to do. There wasn't much cleanup. And then as he standing there, something horrible happened. Hey, you. Because the boiler had been left on, all that ash was still getting melted and turned into slag. Mm. And the slag was not being drained because that plug had formed over the man-sized hole in the boiler. And so you have all the slag that's building up, building up. It's getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And about 20 minutes into their cleanup operation, the weight of all that slag broke through that plug, immediately creating an opening where all this red hot slag, this lava came tumbling down. It rebounded on the back end of the empty water tank and shot out of the doghouse door like a tidal wave of hellfire. Dang. And in seconds, thousands of gallons of this lava-like substance was all over all six men. It was like a wave going over them. And then after the slag hits the ground, they were all standing in six inches of basically lava that stretched in 40 feet in any direction. Now, unlike trying to run in, let's say, mud or deep water, where you're just kind of moving slowly, every step you take in this slag, basically your foot melts into the slag. So with every step, your shoe melts, then your skin melts, then your bones melt into this substance. And so all these men, after immediately being hit with this stuff and catching on fire, literally, they likely tried to start running, but it was like their bodies were slowly consumed by this slag feet first. And so Antonio tried to run like the rest of them, but he couldn't go anywhere and he fell onto the slag. So he's laying on his side, and as he's melting and burning to death, he reaches into his pants pocket with his free hand and he pulls his phone out and he calls his mother. She doesn't pick up and so he leaves her a voicemail and all he says is, Mom, Mom, I'm burning. Please call the cops. Please, Mom. And in the background of this voicemail, all you hear is the hissing sound of the steam and slag pouring out of the boiler. In total, five of the six men that were a part of this repair operation would be killed from this tidal wave of slag. 
Antonio would be one of them. Tampa Electric would end up paying out a settlement to each of the families of the deceased. That's crazy. So that's going to do it, guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please log on. See all that machinery, that heavy machinery, man. It'd be dangerous, my boy. I repeat all those guys, man, working hard to make a living, you know what I'm saying? So, hey, let me know y'all's thoughts on Mr. Ballin' Reaction. Like, comment, subscribe, hit notification bell. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, at Forward Fabian. Be sure to check out um, my Mr. Ballin' playlist. Catch you guys in the next video. Peace.